Let's stand this morning and welcome the Lord here. God is good, isn't he? Give him praise in the house, will you? God is good. Hallelujah. Let's just pray and welcome him. Father, we love you here this morning. We thank you for your blessings. We ask your Holy Spirit to flow into this place. We ask you, God, to move outside this building. Touch Harley this morning. Let strength, let health come to him. We thank you for all that you do for us, for everything that you do. We give you praise, glory, and honor. We've come into your house to praise you. We've come to give you thanks. This is the day you have made. Bless us here this morning as we bless you and as we praise you in Jesus' name. Clap your hands to God. Praise God. God is here. God is expecting you to worship him. Hallelujah. The name of Jesus. What a name. Praise God. Hallelujah. Cross the empty grave. 
Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. Well, he's alive, and oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. When I stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face, I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. In this joy and perfect peace, earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. Well, he Let your fire fall down on me. Rick 
You are here. You are here, moving in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. In the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We call you Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you I worship you, I worship you, and you are here, healing every heart. I worship you, I worship you, and you are here. I worship you, I worship you, and you are here working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. We make miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We call you Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We call you Waymaker, Miracle Worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. Because even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Because even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Because even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Cause even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. We call you Waymaker, Miracle Worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We call you Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, light in the darkness, my God, 
That is who you are. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Call you a maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We call you way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Let's give him praise in the house this morning. That's who he is. That's who he is. He's a promise keeper. He's a miracle worker. That's who he That's what he is. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> of course, you know this is still part of the worship, giving honor to God. And so we come before the Lord the first day of the week to give of our resources. And I had a thought this morning. You've heard scores of times we ministers would minister on Malachi 3. But I was thinking this morning about the windows of heaven God would open. But yet in heaven itself there are no windows. So what is he, the writer, talking about? He's talking about as we are obedient and we see the light which illuminates truth, how that God can supernaturally make an opening in the heavenlies because of your obedience of giving as a sacrifice, as a sweet savor unto him, a sweet aroma can reach unto him because you are obedient because your flesh will resist and tell you not to, not to give, not to be a tither and a give gifts and, and give exceedingly abundantly the way God says bless you so that he can supersede that supernaturally into your natural life and give pressed down, shaken over till it runs out that those that are around you says there is a God at operation in your life. But God wants to open in your life this morning windows avenues of heaven but it requires our obedience remember Samuel says our disobedience this is a sin of witchcraft so obey God deny your flesh this morning and become a if you're not a tither become a, a tither and a gift giver unto the kingdom work of God and prove God that he will not pour you out a blessing that you'll not be able to contain just obey God as the ushers come at this time and takes up your offering. And God bless you this morning as they do so. God is so good. Hallelujah. God, I thank you for being so kind to us. You've never dealt with us fairly. You've dealt with us in mercy, grace, kindness, and compassion. You've been more than a God. 
Oh, mighty God, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. like that little chorus, I'm surrounded by him. You like that? Give God praise for you. Amen. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Ron, would you like to tell that testimony, what you just told me this morning? Come right up here and do that for us. Praise God. I like good things, don't you? I like to hear good things. You hear a lot of bad things. I I'm glad to hear good. Come on up here. You're good. I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> I was telling Pastor this morning that uh, there's a family that came from Iraq. I'm not really sure how they got here other than the government brought them over. And uh, the head of the household, he was a bomb maker, they taught him, he sang. And maybe he, I'm not sure the real story, maybe he turned... American government or not, but anyway, him and, and his family got from over there. And one of those people that got to come was this young girl. She's 25 years old. And I found out about her, but anyway, God put her on my heart. I mean, you want to be obedient. <laughs> don't you? You know, the main thing in our life, if you don't do nothing, try to win somebody or pray for someone because the whole thing is going to all the world to preach the gospel that people may be saved. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for Jesus, they can't make it. He's made a way. It's not just limited to, to, to a few. We all have a way through him. But anyway, God put her on my heart, and I got to go down, and I met her. And probably for an hour, I talked to her because God had been burning my heart to speak to her. And I told her about God, and I told her that the God that she served, I said, I'm not trying to make you mad, but I said, that's not God. I said, the God that I know had a son, and their God doesn't. Not that they would know. And I explained to her the story about how Jesus got here and who he was. His name was Emmanuel, God in the flesh, that God loved us so much that he came down and sacrificed himself. It wasn't just a, another human being. It was God in the flesh who gave his life for us. And I talked to her, and she was really, I mean, I could tell she was really listening, and other people that was in there was listening too. And I got to tell her about who Christ is. And I said, if, if this is bothering you, I said, I can stop. She said, no. She said, I've got goosebumps going up, up, down, down. And I said, that's the Holy Spirit. I said, you don't understand, but I said, it's the Holy Spirit. But anyway, we left. And after we left, I couldn't get her off my mind. I was praying for her, and God just kept her in my heart. And then I found out that she told the people that, that she wanted to change her religion. And I thought, she wants to change her religion. That's a, that's a no-no in that religion. If you do, you know, bad things could happen to you. So anyway, on my wife's birthday, which is the 10th, they made a trip all the way to our house. And I got to go back over it again, who God is and how much he loves us and why he came here on this, on this earth and what have you and what, why it's so important to believe in Jesus because without him, there's no other door. There is no other way to heaven except through Christ. And I explained to her, and I said, now, do you believe this Jesus is God in the flesh. Do you believe that he is the one who God came down through a virgin, not through man, but through a virgin, and was born in the flesh, Emmanuel, we call his name Jesus, but he's actually God here in this life. I said, do you believe this? God came to us and lived and died for our sins and rose again, and she agreed to it, and she prayed that prayer, and she got saved because of that very thing. But we need to be our hearts, I mean, God has put it on my life and in my heart here lately. Every day I try to pray, Lord, save everyone, not just my friends and people I know. We know people as Americans. We know people here. We are so privileged to have the gospel. I mean, you can turn the TV on or now through electronic stuff. It's available to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't have that. They were brought up. Now, don't get me wrong. For a long time, I didn't like these people because of the bad things they do, and I still don't like the bad things. 
but I pray for their souls because I guarantee you once they know about Jesus and will receive him, they'll go to the same heaven that I go to, the same God that loves me, loves them too. So just pray, just pray for people that you don't even know. Say, God, open it up to me. Maybe I'll, maybe not by what you say, but, you know, they watch your walk too. So just try to live your life for Christ. Who knows, maybe God will use me. I just thank him for the privilege of using me for this one person. Good testimony. The Bible said, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are wholesome, whatsoever things are of good report, think on those things. What a wonderful privilege it is to be able to share your hope with people that don't have hope. Some have hope in this life, and that's about as far as it goes. Only Christians have hope of a life beyond here. Serving God, living for God is the best life that you can live. I'm going to turn you this morning to 2 Corinthians 4.18. We actually read that verse last week, but I'm going to read it for you again this morning. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to preach to you for a while about waking up or stirring up the faith that is on the inside of you. There is not a person in this building that is without faith. There's not one. The Bible said God has dealt to every person a measure of faith. Regardless of where your life is, like this lady you're talking about there, every person has the potential of accepting Jesus Christ into their life and having a changed, transformed life by the power of God. That availability is for you. It is for me. And once God comes into your life, he makes marvelous, marvelous changes in the life that you have and the, the existence that you're surviving in. God can make enormous differences in your life. You need the faith of God today. I need greater faith in God. I have a measure, but there is a greater measure, a greater dimension of faith that I can come to. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4.18 and says this, While we look not at the things which are seen, but if the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. I want to dwell on that here this morning, and I want to talk to you about the enlarging of your faith, waking up, stirring up the faith that is on the inside of you. Great things can be done for God if we will allow God to really stir into our spirit. I, the psalmist says to us in Psalm 68 and verse 1, when the enemy shall come in, I'm sorry, uh, that whenever your enemies come, God will scatter them. God will scatter them. When, if you'll let God arise, the enemies will be scattered. Now what that means is this, that in your effort for God, in your attempt to live for God, there will always be enemies that will be out there with an effort and an attempt to shoot you out of the saddle. There will be all kinds of trials. There will be people with a story to tell. There will be someone that will rise up against you in opposition. There will always be enemies to the faith of God that is on the inside of you. But he is telling me that if I will allow God to arise, that God and release my faith in God, my enemies cannot stay together they will have to scatter out and they'll have to fall away because they cannot stand against the faith of God. I need greater faith in Jesus. I need a greater endowment of the Holy Spirit than I've ever experienced before in my life. If you're walking by faith this morning and you're not walking by sight but by faith, you have to draw away from looking at the circumstances that are around you. You're all surrounded by circumstances. Life has brought you to where you are. Life has delivered you to where you are. And sometimes the circumstances of your life aren't looking well. There are some of you that have been through misfortune after misfortune. You have been through headache and heartache. You have been through all kinds of problems in life. And it is time for you to understand that your circumstances do not have control of your life only you and your faith in God can govern your next step and determine where you will go in Jesus. If you believe that, give God a praise here this morning. When you begin to face your enemy through faith, 
the enemy, no matter how many they are, will have to begin to shatter. They will scatter apart. They will break apart. They cannot stand in a union against you when you stand in the covenant with God. Greater faith, let God arise. Let your enemies be scattered. I reminded of certain events in the Bible where people walk by great faith in God. Now, when I see many of them and I read their stories, it makes me to understand that my faith is shallow, my faith is small compared to the greatness of men and women of the past that have lived for God, that have died for God, that have gone into the presence of God, <coughs> but they did not lose their faith in God. When I walk through the struggles of life and all of a sudden in the middle of my struggle, I begin to look at what I could have done or what I should have done or what might have happened. When I begin to see the circumstance and I allow the circumstance to govern my mind, I'm never going to be able to go forward in God. Maybe you have in your life, maybe you've suffered uh, maybe divorces or you might have suffered bankruptcies or you might have suffered this or that, but none of those things are permanent. All of them are just temporary. And you need to understand that wherever I am in my life, as long as I am looking at those negative situations and negative circumstances, I will never have a future because my past is controlling me. I will never be able to walk out toward the horizon of tomorrow as long as I am allowing yesterday to drag me back. I've got to keep pushing. I've got to keep moving forward. I've got to keep saying that by faith in God, I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. The Bible said of Abraham in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that he sojourned seeking for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker was God. Now, if you were to go back into the book of Genesis and read the story of Abraham, you would have never recognized what his pursuit was. It never identified it. It never told us about it. But when the writer of Hebrews writes to identify who Abram was, Abraham was, it said he sojourned and never quit looking for a city. He never quit seeking for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker was God. There's a lot of cities that are built. Our city here, cities large, cities smaller. And in every one of them, there are certain foundational guidelines that have been laid down by our fathers before us. But there is a city that has foundations that is of eternal design and is called New Jerusalem. Everybody say New Jerusalem. <coughs> New Jerusalem was a creation of God. Abraham sought for that city. <coughs> New Jerusalem, the Bible said, had 12 foundations under it. The 12 foundations were each named by the 12 apostles of the Lamb. It is a foundation of city. Abraham, by faith in God, understood and recognized there is a place, there is a plane, there is a dimension, there is a place somewhere beyond here that is far greater than what I have today. I don't care what you have in life. I don't care how happy your family is. I don't care how much money you have, how much money you're making, what kind of car you're able to drive or house you're able to live in. All of those things are temporal and last only for a moment. They're only for a little while. If you gain the whole world and lose your soul, what would you give in trade for your soul? What would you trade your life for? What would you trade your eternity for? He never arrived. Abraham never arrived into that city but he never quit pursuing. He never never quit looking for it. He was always seeing it in the mind eye of faith. He saw it out there, though he physically was never able to arrive there. If you can't see it in your mind's eye and you can't see it in your faith spirit, you'll never see it in actuality. If you intend to go to heaven, you've got to see heaven in your spirit. You've got to see it in your faith. Because if you don't see it in your faith, <coughs> you will never be able to see it in actuality. Give God praise, will you? <coughs> he never quit searching for that city. He never quit looking. He believed that somewhere out there that there was a city that he could go to, that there was a place that he could arrive to 
And if he kept pursuing, he was going to get there. How many have started out in their faith walk with God believing that Jesus' grace was sufficient? They believe that if they would come to God, turn their life over to God, and if the faith of God become, became a part of their life, that everything would be fine. But then through time, they gave up their trip. They gave up their journey. They walked away from their living for God. Maybe they went after other things. They sought things that would not really give them an eternal degree of gratification. They only sought those things that they thought and hoped would give them peace, would give them joy, and would give them fulfillment. Only to understand that if you gain the whole world and everything came into the palm of your hand, nothing really counts in the weight of Jesus. He is the most fulfilling thing. I know when I was a young guy and before I came to God, I heard a lot about Jesus. When I would visit my grandfather, I would hear so much about him. I knew very little about him. But there was one scripture that I had learned in Sunday school. And I never forgot that verse all through the years of growing up. Actually, it was in an RA's class. I had learned it. And that is that if I would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I could be saved. I believed that and I held that verse and I held that in the honor of my spirit. I would visit my grandfather, and he would tell me about eternity, and he would tell me about heaven, and he would tell me about things and conditions of life that are going on all around us. And I would see that, but I really didn't see it. I understood in part, but I couldn't quite grasp what he was talking about. But there came that moment of time when suddenly Jesus Christ came, and when the power of the Holy Spirit moved upon the faith that I had, and moved upon what little knowledge of God I had, I just could not do anything less than totally surrender my life to Jesus. And when I gave it over to God, all of a sudden things changed. All of a sudden ambitions and desires, will and purposes began to change. What I wanted out of life took on new meaning. I wanted God more than anything else in this world. Abraham was that same kind of guy. He wanted God. He pursued God from the day that he came to know God as a young man in Genesis chapter 12 until the day that he breathed his last breath. He never quit searching for that city, never found it, but kept searching. One day, he was able to give up the ghost and leave this world. And guess what? Immediately, he arrived into that which he believed was out there. He came into that place that God had prepared for him. We are today walking not by sight, but we're walking by faith. Paul speaks that to us in the, in the fifth chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians. He said, you're not walking by sight. You're walking by faith in God. The people of faith walk by what they hear instead of what they see. There is an inner voice. There is a speaking of the voice of the Spirit of God on the inside of them. Circumstances cannot dominate us and cannot defeat us if we're walking by faith in God. Because when I have faith in God, if I do fail, I get back up and run again. I know that God loves me whether I'm in victory or whether I'm a failure. I know that God loves me whether I did everything right or I made the ultimate, ultimate mistake. No matter what, God loves me as long as I'm willing to get up and run again in the kingdom of God. I am not defeated and I'm not dominated by the power of the circumstances that are around me. I want to tell you there's often times the circumstances are very negative. There are times that the circumstances are very brutal and beating me down and they try to destroy. They will try to destroy your character. They will try to destroy your name that you have tried to build up. They will try to destroy your influence in the community. They will try everything they can to bring you down to nothing. But in the middle of all of that, I'm not hearing the dominating power of the forces of defeat. I'm hearing the voice of God, and I'm hearing the promises of God that says you can, you will. I will not leave you. I will stay with you all the way even to the end of the world. Hallelujah. We are hearing greater than what we are seeing. Our hearing is the most important thing that we have. 
It's not the hearing of the outer ear. It's the hearing of the inner faith. It's hearing the voice of God. It is knowing that God is speaking, that faith is important, and faith is not based upon what we see. One day, Jesus was walking along with his disciples. This is in the 11th chapter of the book of Mark and beginning in verse 13. When he walks by, apparently they were somewhat hungered, and they walked upon a fig tree, and they thought, if we can go to this fig tree because this fig tree looked to be more healthy than any other fig tree. And when Jesus arrived there in verse 13, here's what he said. And seeing the fig tree afar off, having leaves, it looked healthy from afar off. He came, if happily there might be anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been hungry enough to want to eat leaves off of a fig tree. Jesus wasn't seeking leaves. He was seeking fruit. He was looking for production that has come from that tree. Now, here's what Jesus said. He answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee of this tree hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. Now, when Jesus prayed over that tree and said, Nobody will ever eat one fig from this tree, the disciples immediately saw no reaction. And so they thought that Jesus really had not gotten his prayer through, that he had missed it somehow, that it was not going to happen. There are times in our life, see, we might come for prayer because we have a headache, but whenever it's a time that maybe the doctor has says we're terminal with cancer, all of a sudden we found it was easier to want prayer for the headache than it was for the terminal cancer. Because the bigger the illness, the harder it is. The more severe the circumstances, the harder the trial becomes. And so Jesus never doubted what he said, but he walked on. The disciples saw what was happening, and it appeared that Jesus' prayer had not been successful. The tree still looked healthy. The leaves still looked good. There was no fruit on it, but the tree showed absolutely no sign of change. But remember, Jesus had said, nobody will ever eat of this tree again. Something was happening even though it was not seen. This is the way faith operates. Though I do not see the circumstances immediately, I believe that God is bigger than. I remember well when I had the cancer and the doctors had said I would not survive until my next birthday. By the time I was to have my birthday, this was in October, and they said, you will never live to see your next birthday. Go home and set things in order. Now, I, I didn't like that circumstances. I didn't like the odds of that at all. It didn't sound so good. In fact, it sounded very, very bad. But you know what? Even though I didn't feel any different, I didn't know any different, when I had prayer, I made a trip down to... Uh, uh, hole in wall uh, Tennessee to a meeting and I went up for prayer and when I went up for prayer I felt nothing <coughs> I didn't feel any special sensation I didn't feel like running the aisles in fact I was so physically weak I couldn't have ran the aisles if I wanted to <coughs> but I knew that I needed something from God I, I was like the tree that had all the leaves but no figs. I didn't have any fruit. The evidence was not there. But all of a sudden, the, though the circumstances looked bad that night that I had the prayer and didn't look much better the next day, all of a sudden things began to transition in my life and changes began to take place. Where I was having trouble in arriving early here to church to get into the building because I could hardly walk in. And when I was not preaching anymore, all of a sudden I was feeling good and I wasn't having to make shifts to get into the building. All of a sudden I began to feel a little extra energy, a little extra strength, a little extra power. Then within a couple of weeks I was out walking the sidewalk a mile or so at a time. The evidence was immediately that nothing had happened. The evidence immediately was <coughs> that the prayer had not been successful. But there was something happening that was not visible to the natural eye. It was a circumstance 
that was not that I could not allow to take control of my mind of faith because I believed what the prophet of God spoke to me when he said, God has taken that sickness out of your body. And he spoke that, and I believed it. You know what? I didn't come this morning to tell you my story again, but, but I, just have to, I just have to tell you that when the circumstances look negative and when the situation looked very bleak and very dire and it looked very hopeless, all of a sudden something began to change. When Jesus said to this tree, you're never going to produce fruit again, it appeared that he had missed in his prayer and nothing was going to take place. What they could not see was that under the soil, the roots had already begun to dry up, and that tree was dying even though it did not know yet that it was dead. It was as good as gone. Then the Bible said in verse 20 of this, the next morning they, the apostles and Jesus, passed by. And when they passed by, they saw the fig tree was dried up from the roots. The evidence was not there immediately, but when faith spoke to that tree, it began to dry up from the root system. Now, if you will allow God to speak into your spirit today, I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what the blemishes of your past are. If you will allow God to do it, he will destroy that thing that has grown up in your life from the root system up. When the root is gone, the element is over. If the circumstance is over, the situation is over. Give him praise this morning. <coughs> That's how faith works. Faith works by working into the root system. Faith is trusting God even when it does not see one glimmer of hope at all. Faith is trusting and believing that God can even when the appearances of the circumstances are overwhelmingly negative, faith believes that I can receive. Now, stepping out of your comfort zone takes faith. My comfort zone is, is that if I get sick, I visit a doctor. My comfort zone is, is that if my fever gets too high, I go to the hospital. My comfort zone is, is that if I'm feeling lonely, I will come to you for somebody to just be there to talk to me. That's my comfort zone. But if I will step out of that comfort zone, Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you all the way, even until the end. Without faith, the Bible said, it is impossible to please God. What that means is this, that if your life that you're living today is not requiring faith from God to operate on the inside of you, you are not pleasing God. Faith has got to be operating. Faith has got to be building. Faith has got to be gaining momentum. Faith energizes you and moves you toward the target of success. We are not walking by sight. We are walking by faith. Don't let what you see around you hinder you from letting God speak something into your spirit that will give you faith that you can overcome. Don't allow your circumstances to control you and to dominate you. Let God speak into your spirit. The Bible said faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let God speak into your spirit. Let God speak his word. You can't go by what you see. You've got to live by what you hear. You've got to listen to hear what the Scripture has to say. And if you're, whatever you're hearing right now from God will determine whether you or whether you are not going to be an overcomer. It's what you're hearing from God. If you allow circumstances to control you, you'll never have the victory. I remember one day in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 5, the, the great anointed king of Israel, David. Wow, he had come into a time of battle. It was to be a time of, of, uh, that he entered a war zone. It wasn't going to be an easy time. It was a battlefield. 
And he said to God, he said, God, do I just need to go out there and attack the enemy? And God says, no, you just need to go out to the battlefield and go off to the sideline and sit down under the mulberry tree. Now, is that what you ordinarily would want to do in time of a war? No, you don't want to wait till the next day when the Philistines have three or four or five to one to your army and you don't have any equipment really to fight with but maybe a sword. You don't want the odds of five to one. You don't give them time to restructure and to revamp and to get everything ready. But God said you go and sit down under the mulberry tree and you wait there until you hear the sound of the winds rustling through the mulberry tree. Now, I'm sure to David that sounds strange. David was a man of war. He was a man of battle. That sounded strange. But he believed that God was smarter than him. And he believed that what God had set up the strategy for, God was able to fulfill and complete. God said, I will go before you, and I'll fight those Philistines for you. David is looking at overwhelming odds of an army stronger, bigger, and more powerful than the little army that he has. But God says to him, don't focus, David, on what you see. Listen to what you hear. I'm telling you what to do. Go sit down under the mulberry tree. Now, what you see may not look, it may look just like defeat. To David, that looked like a strategy of defeat. But he said, you focus on what you hear. Don't focus on defeat. Don't focus on the size of the opponent. Don't focus on the size of the army that's out there. Put your focus on God and believe that God is in master control. And when you begin to hear the sound of the winds blowing through the mulberry tree, you move out. Start the battle, and I will give you the victory. Well, he did that, and he sat down. And all of a sudden, one afternoon, God sent a wind, and he heard the wind shaking the mulberry bush. And when he heard the wind shaking, he said, Come on, guys, it's time to go. And in a moment of time, he had defeated an army bigger, stronger, and more well-equipped than his because God had set up the strategy. When your circumstances look bad, trust Jesus. When the environment around you looks like you're going to be defeated, trust Jesus. When it looks like there's not a friend in the world you can depend on, trust Jesus. He is the ultimate. He's the utopia. He is enough if you'll just trust in the power of God. Faith is not looking at the facts. Faith is not looking and saying, I just might as well give up. Faith stands against defiant circumstances. And faith says that if God be for me, who can be against me? Heaven never talks defeat. Heaven never tells you about defeats. Heaven tells you to never give up. Heaven speaks to you that you got to keep plowing your way through. Don't watch circumstances because circumstances will create fear, and fear has torment. And when fear brings torment, it will hurt you from having the next step of victory. you got to fight against that. By faith, I can say, I have the victory over what I see because what I hear speaks louder than what I see. And what I hear is, I am more than an overcomer. I can do it. I will do it. I'm going to make it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where is our faith in God? I hear Elisha walking out on a scene one day. It is a famished land. It's a horrible situation to be in. He is a prophet of God. Everybody's wondering what he's going to do. He's wondering what he's going to do. He doesn't know the answer. He doesn't know what to do. The world had not seen a drop of water to fall in three and a half years. Now think about that. Not one drop of water had fallen in three and a half years. The appearances were bad. The water brooks had all dried up. The plants were all withering away. Famine was in the land. People were dying. Plants were dying. Animals were dying. And Elijah... Elijah goes to God in prayer. And when he's in God, going to God in prayer, he comes back in the middle of a famished environment now. All the circumstances are negative, And they said, Elisha, 
What do you got to say? He said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Now listen to this. Here we are in a situation where it has not rained for three and a half years, where everything around them that they're seeing is famine, and this man of God is saying, you see famine, I see abundance. Abundance of rain is going to come. That's faith. You've got to choose what you hear over what you see. You've got to choose, I will listen to the voice of God, and what God says, I will do it in Jesus' name. Give him praise in the house this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus said, you should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, the bread is what you see. The word of God is what you don't see. It's what God speaks into your inner spirit. You can learn to quote the Bible and be able to quote everything that is in the word of God. But if you have not allowed that word to become alive unto you until it quickens itself into your spirit in times, I hear Jesus say this, you'll be brought before councils and men. And when you're brought before councils and men, it shall turn to you for testimony. Now, he didn't say the council will turn to you. It shall turn to you. He means this. The Holy Spirit of God will come into the inside of you. He'll search out what is in you, and God will bring out of you what needs to come out of you in that hour. Don't seek your own revenge. Don't seek your own effort. Let God fight your battles, and your enemy cannot stand in survival against you as long as you stand in the purpose and will of God. Give him praise in the house this morning. Trent, will you come back to the music for me, please? Faith comes by hearing, not seeing, but by hearing of the word of God. We walk not by faith. We walk by what we we we, we uh, walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by what we hear and not by what we see. We walk by what we hear and not by what we see. We've got to walk by faith in God. In this building this morning, there are people that are suffering. There are people that are in need. There are people that are hurting. There are people that have been through physical hurts. Some of you are still hurting. There are people that have been through deep emotional scars and hurts and cuts, and you're still wounded from those things. When you needed help, you felt like you didn't get it. You felt like that the whole world was turned against you. But you've got to say, circumstances don't legislate my mindset. Circumstances don't control the way I'll call my next move. I'm going to sit down in the middle of negative. I'm going to sit down in the middle of critical circumstances when everything around me is bad, and I'm going to wait until I hear the sound of the rustling in my mulberry tree. God's going to send a wind. God's going to send the wind, and the answer is going to come. If you listen to the news today, it'll run you absolutely crazy. You listen to all the bad things going on in the world today, it'll make you feel like that you're in a world of hopelessness. But listen to me. I'm hearing a news from a different source. I'm hearing a news from a different source. I'm hearing a news that's coming from a different world. And it's saying unto me, everything's going to be all right. It's saying to me that no matter what goes on in the world around you, you're not of this world. You've been born of the world above. Hallelujah. You're not bound by the world's economy. God is saying, you're going to, I'm going to take care of my people. Don't you worry about it. The righteous are not forsaken, and the seed of God is is not begging bread. God is saying to us, if the famine occurs, I know where abundance is, and I can send abundance when the world is in a famineish condition. He'll be your God, and he will operate in his own economy. you got to trust God, believe God, rely upon God. As we stand together in this building this morning, I want every person in this building to step out toward this front. I want you not just to stand around here. I want hands lifted. I want you to kneel at this altar in prayer if you are in need. But I want us to pour our hearts out to God. Oh, let me tell you, God, come on, come on, come on, come on. Faith is knowing that God can. 
God can, God can, God can. And I speak faith and I speak blessing over this congregation today. I speak healing over the bodies of the sick that are here today. I speak deliverance over the handicap that is wounded and scarred and beat down here today. I speak strength into your weakness because God is your source of strength. I speak victory over your setbacks. I speak salvation unto your family because God is not willed that any should perish, but that all might be saved. Come on, let's begin to worship. Hallelujah. May the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 overcome your life. May the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 bring abundance of resources into your life. I speak grace and mercy over your life that surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life and that you'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I plead the blood of Jesus over this congregation. Oh, God, send the power of the blood. Send the anointing of the blood. Oh, yes, over every life, we plead the blood. Over every soul, we plead the blood. We are not losing the message of the blood. We are thankful that Jesus died for our sin because he did not want us to perish. Come on, folks. Begin to worship. Just begin to pray. Begin to pour your hearts out to God. God, I'm here to worship. God, I'm here to worship. I'm hungering for you. Where is the blood in our modern-day church? The blood was a symbol of our victory, and the blood is the only reason why we are here this morning. And I, it gives me the triumphant power over death hell and the grave. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you, Jesus, for what you are. We love you and adore you. We love you and adore you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, folks. Let's begin to worship him. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I praise you. God, I give you glory. God, I give you honor. I give you honor. I give you honor. I give you I will worship my God. Oh, yes. I will worship my God. Oh, yes. I will worship the one who gave his life for me. Yeah. I will worship my God. Oh, hallelujah. I will worship my King. I will Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
There's a God that's bigger than Allah. There's a God bigger than all the gods of this world, no matter what they're named. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God, release those under the bondage to false gods. Bring them to understand and know that the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus is sufficient for them. Lord God, we declare the power of your blood over this congregation of people. We declare healing over them, God, in the name of Jesus, rescuing them, God, from the power of oppression that would come against them. We speak victory, God, in the defeats that we have suffered in the past. We speak, God, that your name is bigger than every circumstance and situation that we've ever been in. Regardless of what the enemy would say, we will lift up the name of our God. And when we lift up the name of our God, our enemies have to scatter. They cannot stand. Their resources cannot stand. Their testimony cannot stand. Scatter the enemy in Jesus' name. Oh, God, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you. <clears throat> we give you praise. We give you praise. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Do you love him? Do you love him this morning? Do you just love him? I'm so glad you are here today. Thank you for being here. We're glad for all of our guests that are here this morning. Give God a good applaud for our guests. Thank you for being here. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, yes. The enemy has to fall. The image of Nebuchadnezzar stood 90 feet tall. But when the glory of God came as a stone rolled down out of the mountain, the enemy had to fall at the command of a small rock because when the glory of God comes, the power of the enemy cannot stand against God. It's got to fall. It's got to come down. The enemy's got to crumble in Jesus' name because greater is the God that's on the inside of us than all the forces of evil that's out there in the world around us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so glad for you this morning. God bless you all. God bless you all. I love those girls right over there. They're sweet kids. You're blessed. You're blessed. Hallelujah. Come up here. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Come up here. Come here. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what others are doing, and I don't care what's going on. When they're here, you look back there, and their hands are lifted to heaven, and they're praising God and worshiping God. <laughs> they don't care if the other young people are, are flipping dimes or are, are talking about yesterday or what they're going to do tomorrow. What's going? They've got their hands lifted, praising and worshiping God, and that's wonderful. Wonderful. These are sweet kids. I love, I love to see young people worshiping God. Now, I'm not trying to embarrass them. I'm trying to compliment you. Just keep on worshiping. Keep on praising. That's what God wants you to do. That's what God wants you to do. Hallelujah. God bless you this morning. Great to see you. Great to see you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Amen.